And for those who started to work on recasting yesterday and who want to follow up after the school, please send me an email with your contact so that I can, I can follow and we can interact more easily. And I know exactly who is interested to move on. I would like to just to keep track a little bit. So please just, just send me an email. Thank you. Okay, so we can start. Thanks a lot, Ken, for giving this talk. I think it will be very interesting. Thank you. Morning, everybody. So welcome to the first of two hours that we have together on uh, EFTs, effective field theories, searching for new physics. So this is the outline. Hopefully, we'll get through all of it. Uh, I'll start with an intro. Probably, hopefully, the first hour will largely be this introduction to EFT, so various concepts, a few examples, um, and an explicit exercise of matching uh, an EFT. Uh, and then part two will be about the standard model as an effective field theory. Uh, so essentially uh, what a lot of the efforts uh, at the LHC are, are currently uh, being directed towards. And then uh, uh, a couple of applications as well of uh, some recent results uh, and, and things that people are, are working on at the moment uh, uh, concerning standard model EFT at the LHC. So here I just put a bunch of... Uh, uh, references that, that, that I use to, to, to prepare these lectures. In particular, I'd like to thank uh, Sen, Eleni, and Gauthier, who gave these kinds of lectures in previous incarnations of, of the Madagraph School and inspired uh, a lot of the content uh, in my slides. So part one. Uh, the starting point is, is really that nature contains an abundance of, of physical scales. Uh, and so that's from the Hubble all the way to the Planck scale. And, and if you want to make sense of, of a particular problem, then, then it's probably useful to identify the, the relevant scales involved. For example, you don't really need to know what composition of various planets are in order to calculate their orbital motion uh, around, around a star. Or, Perhaps you don't really need to know either the short distance properties of the electroweak theory in order to calculate the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. So there's, you know, <laughs> those things are details that don't really affect the bulk of the problem, and so perhaps you can just neglect them. And of course, in, in high energy physics, we use QFT to compute scattering amplitudes uh, to, to get processes that we're interested in. And so that would be things like collider cross-sections, dark matter, annihilation and detection uh, probabilities, uh, various decay rates for particles, etc. And so, so the relevant scales there are really the masses of the particles, the external momenta, the energies of the colliders, etc. And so this concept of scale separation is useful because computations can be quite challenging. So especially when they involve multiple scales, which might be very different from each other. Uh, uh, and, and of course, it's important to um, realize that not all scales may be relevant for a given problem. And so QFT uh, problems with this feature of scale separation can, can often be reorganized into this effective description, where indeed you control then uh, the, the calculation by ratios of such uh, separate scales. So either ratios or logs of the ratios. And so if you imagine, say, for example, a scattering amplitude uh, at a particular energy E that depends on two mass scales, one little m, one big M, uh, where the energy of the uh, process is of order little m, and both of them are much less than big M, then uh, the expectation is that this heavy new physics shouldn't have a big impact on the low energy phenomenon. So low energy being the energy that you're, you're looking at right now. And so you might be able to approximate the effects uh, that depend on this, this heavy mass scale. And indeed, perhaps even describe it by some kind of expansion in ratios of small scales over large scales, some power. And that's the, the, what's called power counting. And indeed, this is uh, formalized in the so-called uh, decoupling theorem by uh, Apoquist and Carazzone in the 70s, where they showed, indeed, that uh, effects of heavy new physics with a large mass decouple at low momentum p. So in the end, the impacts of these heavy particles can only be uh, shifts of the low energy renormalization constants of the theory and effects of order uh, p squared over m squared. So this uh, expansion here, so where p squared is some generic uh, low energy uh, uh, kinematic quantity. So this is really the basis of the viability of the so-called effective field theories. And so if you apply them at the right scale, these EFTs can predict things with essentially arbitrary precision. 
Uh, and indeed, the, you can think of the world as being divided into a successive slices of EFTs, each describing different relevant physics at that scale. So for us, for, for us people that are interested in, in BSM physics and, and using QFT, this really means only including particles that are heavy enough to be produced at the energy of interest. And your other fields are integrated out and appear indirectly via these, these power corrections here in, in energy over the heavy mass. So your Lagrangian for your full theory, which might involve some light fields and some heavy fields, gets converted into this full Lagrangian only involving the light fields, plus an effective Lagrangian, which is also a function of the light fields, but encodes indirect effects from, from, from the, the mass scale of these heavy fields. So there are two uh, globally slightly different reasons for using an EFT. Uh, firstly, if you know the full theory already, then you might use an EFT description to simplify your calculations. So basically uh, approximating the effects of the heavy new physics to try and reduce the complexity. If the full theory is unknown, however, you can use the EFT uh, framework to kind of universally parametrize uh, effects of heavy new physics that you might uh, expect or hope are, are, are around somewhere. And so the first is, is referred to often as a top-down approach, while the second is, is a bottom-up approach. So you just, you're not really sure what, what's up there, but you want to try and capture all possible effects from, from uh, heavy new physics. So every such EFT has some kind of power counting expansion, which is some appropriately small ratio of scales that you use to, to expand. Uh, and, and that then uh, implies a range of validity, so, so scales at which this EFT reliably approximates the full theory. In high energy physics, a few examples that you might have heard of in the case where we kind of know the theory it would be some things like heavy quark effective uh, theory, soft collinear effective field theory, weak effective uh, theory where you integrate out the electroweak states like the W and, and the Higgs and the top, uh, and also non-relativistic QCD. And then the examples of, of bottom-up approaches would be, for example, the Fermi theory that, that Fabio already mentioned, and we'll also look into a little bit later, uh, chiral perturbation theory, uh, the electroweak chiral Lagrangian, and of course the standard model effective field theory, which is going to be the, the main topic of the second part uh, of these lectures. So if you imagine this big uh, uh, range in energy going from the IR all the way up to the UV, this picture of slices of EFT, perhaps you might have some heavy mass scale, new physics, that, that you're not really sure exactly where it lies, but let's say it's somewhere well above the electroweak scale. Uh, and then above there, you have your full UV theory, or perhaps even some other unknown effective field theory. And there, so here you're, you would have another ratio of scales involving some heavy new, extra heavy new physics over the heavy new physics. Um, if we take it down now to the electroweak scale, uh, then in between these scales, you, you could perhaps use, uh, for example, the standard model EFT to describe uh, uh, this physics parameterized by these types of ratios, uh, so uh, energy over the heavy new physics. Also the electroweak Carl Lagrangian, which is kind of a slightly different version of a similar, similar idea. And if you go all the way down to the quark mass scales, uh, you might, uh, in between, so below the electroweak scale, essentially, you have the Fermi theory or the weak effective field theory. Uh, and then all the way down to lambda QCD, where again you have now heavy quark EFT, which expands in these masses. Uh, so lambda QCD over these masses. And then below lambda QCD, there is even another EFT, which is uh, called chiral perturbation theory, which describes the interactions of, of pions and, and chaos and so on. So really, uh, it's possible to really slice up the world into successive effective theories, each describing physics at their relevant scale in a good expansion here in these types of ratios. And then, of course, in terms of experiments, these types of effective theories are often used at, at for example, uh, B physics experiments, uh, whereas perhaps these kinds of slightly higher energy ones would be appropriate at, say, a, a, a E plus E minus collider like LEP. Uh, and of course, now at the LHC, a lot of us, most of us, make use of this standard model EFT. So different experiments happening kind of at different scales. Okay, so I said we would go over Fermi theory again. So the most famous EFT uh, is the Fermi theory of weak interactions. Fabio already mentioned it as a good example in his talk. 
Uh, and indeed, it, was, it came about about 30 years before the development of electroweak theory itself, and it describes beta decay uh, and muon decay via this uh, four fermion contact interaction over here, where this uh, Fermi constant uh, is defined to be the coupling of this uh, four fermion interaction. And as you can see, uh, well, I can tell you that it has uh, a mass dimension of minus two. And so muon decay would uh, be mediated in, in such a way. Of course, we know now that, that in, there's a W boson uh, being exchanged there, uh, and uh, there's a very nice scale separation in this EFT because the W mass is much heavier than, than other relevant scales. And so this is uh, how we do it now. We match the electric, uh, electroweak theory to the Fermi-Lagrangian uh, and demand that the two descriptions give the same result at a particular scale, which would be the muon mass. Uh, sorry, at the W mass. Uh, and uh, so the full theory, if you write this out, the amplitude, you just have a little propagator for the W here and some, some spinorial structure, uh, and, and take the expansion of this propagator here in the, in the limit that MW is much larger than, than the, external, uh, the, the momentum being exchanged, uh, and uh, you get this uh, prefactor in front of this uh, spinor structure, which uh, of course goes like one, so a coupling squared over the mass of the W squared. And on the EFT side, I do the same thing. Of course, I don't really have to do very much because it's already there for me. Uh, and indeed, if I then match the two, I get that these two matrix elements should be equal, and therefore, I can extract GF as a function of uh, G over MW squared, or alternatively, uh, the VEV as a function of GF. Uh, and so both theories predict the same IR physics, but uh, differ in the UV once you do this matching, where the on-shell W, of course, might be able to happen, uh, particularly in other types of scatterings involving these operators. So the Fermi interaction is an example of this high-dimensional operator. Uh, and if you remember your dimensional analysis from, from QFT days, you know that this uh, Lagrangian here uh, in natural units uh, has to have a mass dimension of four. And so that then allows us to infer the various dimensionalities from the kinetic terms and such of uh, the, the uh, let's say, the building blocks of our Lagrangian terms, so the fields themselves, the covariant derivative, et cetera, the couplings. Uh, and so we always uh, are taught that these renormalizable interactions have to have couplings of mass dimension greater or equal to zero. And so your interaction Lagrangian here, if you'd split it up into a coupling and an operator, uh, that implies that the dimension of the mass dimension of the operator should be less than or equal to four. Uh, and so if something is normalizable, just to remind you, you need a finite number of counter terms to absorb divergences in loop computations to all orders in perturbation theory. So that's one way of, of defining renormalizability. And then these uh, operators get split into three different classes where if the dimension of the operator is less than four, you have a dimension full coupling, that's called a relevant uh, interaction. If uh, o is, dimension of O is exactly equal to four, and the coupling is equal, uh, dimension of the coupling is zero, then you get what's called a marginal. And in the other case, where you have higher than four, uh, and therefore your coupling has uh, a mass dimension of less than zero, then these are so-called irrelevant operators, or in our case, higher dimensional operators. So for example, this Fermi interaction, if you add up the dimensions of the four fermions, you get dimension six. So it's a high dimensional operator. And often we write it uh, in such a way that uh, we actually explicitly take out the mass dependence, uh, so the mass dimension of the coupling so that we end up with a dimensionless parameter suppressed by some scale. So this C is called the Wilson coefficient. Uh, and this lambda is, is often referred to as a cutoff, which has nothing to do with loop integration. So don't, don't confuse those two quantities. Uh, and if I then insert such an operator, for example, into a two to two amplitude, so this, uh, this is then our effective Lagrangian involving, uh, say, some coefficient weighting some operator with a dimension greater than four, uh, I pop it into here, for example, this four fermion operator. Uh, knowing that the amplitude of this two to two scattering, the, the uh, mass dimension of this amplitude should be zero, I get that, that the amplitude should scale by some power of the momentum over the scale, which is, corresponds to the mass dimension of, of this operator over here. The amount greater than four that, it, it, that its mass dimension has. And so you see that you expect a power-like dependence on the external momentum when you insert these operators into amplitudes. 
<coughs> which will be at most equal to the power of lambda in the denominator. And uh, one can convince oneself that actually this holds beyond tree level because when you do loop integrations, the final result really only depends on these physical external scales. And in fact, if you use something like dimensional regularization, which discards power-like dependence on unphysical scales, like some arbitrary cutoff in your loop integral, uh, so then you'll see that your, your integral basically depends on uh, physical uh, external parameters like momenta, masses, uh, and then uh, some, type, some kind of normalization scale through logarithms and then perhaps might also have some poles. But in the end, you see that the power-like structure uh, of, the, of the operator should be retained in this uh, beyond tree level at higher orders. And so this then brings about the question of uh, non-normalizability. So one consequence of this power-like behavior is that if you put higher order corrections involving further higher dimensional operators, then this should naively lead to a higher power momentum dependence of the amplitude. So two of these now uh, inserted, then the amplitude should scale by some power-like dependence of P, which is equal to the sum now of the, uh, of the dimensionality of these two operators. And so this implies that renormalizing this theory would require counterterms from a higher dimensional operator than you started with in order to cancel the divergence that comes out from this uh, loop. So Ci plus Cj with some counter term of higher dimensions where the Di plus Dj is the sum of the two dimensions of the operators, minus four, gives you uh, a now a finite result. Which means that actually you technically need an infinite number of counter terms to cancel poles to all orders, which shows that this EFT is formally non-renormalizable. However, as Fabio also mentioned in his talk, uh, you can indeed actually still uh, predict things with this theory, cancel poles uh, order by order in this lambda parameter. So as long as you're careful to truncate this expansion to a given order, you see that the power-like dependence will always be at most a fixed number equal to this uh, to compensating this, this power of lambda, and therefore you can consistently uh, cancel divergences and, and get a predictive theory. So let's uh, work now with a toy model to see this all in action. So what we're going to work with is a Yukawa theory of massless fermions, psi, uh, and a heavy scalar phi. Very simple Lagrangian kinetic terms, uh, and then uh, a heavy mass scale over here of the, of the scalar, and some Yukawa interaction between one uh, scalar field and two uh, fermions. So what we'd like to do is find the EFT that describes physics below the scale m, well below the scale m. So like Fermi theory, integrating out this scalar is gonna to lead to a, to a four fermion interaction. So it's very similar to the W in the Fermi theory. So we expect these types of amplitudes to be pinched and, and be reproduced by these types of contact interactions. And so we might think, okay, the, the low energy EFT, we would expect it to look something like only now the kinetic term for the fermion, since we've integrated out this heavy degree of freedom, and some uh, four fermion operator weighted by some Wilson coefficient and suppressed by this heavy mass scale squared. So let's perform the matching and see how it goes. So at tree level, uh, as I said, you want to be uh, equating predictions for amplitudes from the full theory to the EFT. And here we're gonna use a diagrammatic method, which is really computing the amplitudes, comparing their values, and, and, and doing the matching that way, which is very much like the example I showed you for, for uh, uh, Fermi theory a second ago. So if we just compute this full amplitude on this side, then you have again this spinorial structure over here. It's a bit simpler because it's a scalar particle. Uh, and then this propagator for the scalar. And then here, this is just a T and U exchange, T and U channel exchange. Uh, and then performing this uh, expansion of this propagator, I see that the first term goes like one over the mass squared, and then suppressed by terms of higher powers of Q squared and over M squared. Here I've just collected this spinner structure into this US uh, quantity. On the EFT, again, not much work to do here. You basically just get it straight away because it is just a spinner structure, this, this operator. So, so you see that you get, again, this US structure 
uh, and, and some function of the Wilson coefficient now rather than the fundamental uh, coupling of the theory. And therefore, our tree-level matching condition is uh, very, very simple. Lambda squared equals CS. And so after matching, now our, our dimension six effective theory below the mass scale is equal to this, uh, this uh, quantity weighting the, the, the four fermion operator. So that was quite easy. Um, now, how can we improve this type of description? Uh, well, on one side, you can improve it by including high dimensional operators, which essentially in this particular example uh, amounts to keeping more terms in this expansion of the propagator of the particle. So if I now take also the subleading term in this expansion, uh, in the full theory, and then, and then you see that I need to add, of course, now a dimension eight operator involving four fermion fields, but two extra derivatives also to make, to increase the dimension, and it is now suppressed by fourth power of the mass. And I can do exactly the same matching exercise again, where I see that now uh, ad uh, additional momentum structure uh, occurs, which matches what happens if I multiply this out. And so again, I get another matching condition where C8 is equal, also equal to lambda squared. So that's one way to improve our EFT uh, when we know the full theory, include higher order operators. So we can systematically improve this picture by doing that, but also we can do it by higher order calculations as well in perturbation theory. So let's uh, go a little bit further and try some one loop matching. So we can also improve, as I said, by higher order corrections in some low energy couplings. So now we extend our theory slightly and assume that these fermions couple to the photon. So they have some charge Q. And we'd like to include some next leading order QED corrections to the matching calculation. Uh, and so we take again our full theory and our EFT with our initial operator. We're just staying at dimension six at the moment. Uh, and where I've uh, included this uh, auxiliary uh, IR regulating mass term, which you'll see will uh, make explicit uh, certain cancellations of the IR divergences between the two theories. Because indeed these IR divergences have to match and exactly cancel when I do the loops. And that's because both descriptions have to have the equivalent infrared behavior, because they describe the same thing below the energy of the, uh, below the mass of this heavy particle. Uh, However, they will differ in the UV, and so we'll see that explicitly, of course. And indeed, this is a very useful cross-check for anyone who ever tries to do one of these uh, matching calculations. Make sure your IR poles cancel, because then you, you know you've done something right for sure. So we'd like to calculate, then, the corrections to the same scattering process. So these are the kinds of diagrams that come out in the full theory. Uh, and then on the EFT side, quite similar, where essentially you can just see that every diagram corresponds to a pinched version of, of, of the full theory where you've just uh, turned the scalar particle into a contact interaction. There's also the T and U exchange versions. And it turns out that for dimension six, in this particular type of theory, it's sufficient to set all the external momentum to zero to get the matching. So we'll do that uh, in what follows. So we'll start with a full theory calculation, looking at this type of diagram here, this box. Um, you can write down the amplitude quite simply as a function of couplings, four propagators, uh, including one with a heavy mass corresponding to this guy, and the others have this uh, regulated mass in there. Uh, and if you do the loop integration and expand in this uh, heavy mass scale, that you'll, see, you'll get this result where uh, Indeed, you weight by a loop factor now, and that you have the correct uh, M scaling in the first term, so you expect something of dimension six. Uh, and then here, you see that this IR divergence is, appears, where if I take this to zero, it, it diverges. So this is just, a, we regulated this uh, quantity. Uh, and then, of course, this spinner structure arises, uh, involving now two, two gamma matrices, coming from the fact that the photon couples either side. It turns out that three other diagrams essentially just correspond to permutations of this gamma matrices and convert them into this so-called sigma matrix, which is a, a commutator of pairs of gamma matrices. And so if we add all that stuff together, the first four amplitudes 
uh, one gets the first four diagrams, sorry, one gets uh, this result where a, a slightly different spinner structure has actually come out than what we started with in, in the EFT at least. And this turns out that this Lorentz structure actually doesn't match this uh, CS operator that we wrote down in, in, in the EFT. So we've actually induced a new operator structure at one loop, which cannot be matched to the operator that we wrote down naively. And what that means is that we actually have to add this operator, because there's, there's perhaps no reason why it should be forbidden. Indeed, we see that this theory uh, predicts this operator. So our EFT Lagrangian has to be supplemented now by this new T operator, which corresponds to this T spinner structure with sigma matrices. And so we add it in. Then we have uh, the last two classes of diagrams here, where you, you uh, radiate, uh, have a little photon correction on the vertex. Uh, and uh, one thing that you notice is that this is proportional to the original CS structure. Uh, and, and this uh, UV divergence uh, arises in this particular diagram, which turns out to be related to the renormalization of this Yukawa interaction here, which you can kind of uh, understand by the structure of this uh, vertex correction. And so the final result in the full theory, you have something proportional to the original operator, loop factor, uh, divergence, some IR stuff, uh, and something proportional to a new uh, spinner structure, uh, again, uh, an IR divergence over here. So what we need to do now is do the same thing in the EFT, such that we can now match the theory at one loop. So on the EFT side, the story is quite similar, actually. Uh, this diagram is, is the analog of, of the first diagram that we calculated in the full theory. And pretty much you can write it down trivially by, by writing down what you wrote down originally, uh, but uh, replacing this heavy propagator by, by a 1 over m squared. So the exercise is quite similar. And this time, uh, this structure reveals a UV pole, also a regulated IR divergence. Uh, and, and this tells you that since it's proportional to CS, this is related to a renormalization of the EFT coefficient somehow. But uh, if you see that uh, once I do this same argument about permuting the gamma matrices and getting sigmas, uh, the final result is proportional again to this UT structure, so the second operator, not the original one. So you have a pole in, in a, a different Lorentz structure than what you started from. And that means that you really need an operator counter term proportional to CT. So a counter term for the CT operator in order to cancel this divergence from loops of CS. And this is what leads to and implies operator mixing under uh, normalization group evolution. You'll see that. We'll see that explicitly at the end. So we do this uh, second set of diagrams and uh, see something quite similar. To, to the original one, actually, to the full theory. It's, quite, it's almost the same as this uh, full theory calculation, uh, where in this case, the UV pole here corresponds to a renormalization of CS itself, because it's proportional to the, to the original CS structure. And so we have our final result in the EFT. Something proportional to US, some poles, IR divergences, something proportional to UT. So this is just a, a summary of the two results. And so now we can go ahead and do the matching. So here I've just added the tree level piece as well, which we didn't have before, just some ones here. Uh, and so yes, this is the tree level piece. And then over here are the loops, loop contributions, loop corrections. So we already did the leading order matching before. So we know that this operator CS uh, is, is equal to lambda squared. Uh, plus some order alpha corrections, which we're about to compute. And then this CT doesn't have a tree-level contribution and only arises at order alpha. So if we substitute the leading order matching result into uh, the full theory prediction, then you will see that, as promised, uh, the IR divergences will cancel. So these two among each other and these two among each other. So both theories indeed predict the same IR behavior, which is, which is uh, a relief 
and indeed all dependence on any kind of low-scale variables, masses or momenta, all this stuff will cancel on the matching calculation. If we look now on the UV side, these two happen to match, but in general they don't. So you have a pole in the structure which is not present here. And that's okay because we already said that the two theories would not have the same UV behavior. We only expect them to have the same low energy behavior. So at high energies, uh, they're different, and indeed you have to use some subtraction scheme to perform the necessary renormalization of the various coefficients on the two sides. And finally, we have this uh, renormalization scale dependence here, and, a little, and some explicit dependence here on the, on the heavy mass scale. And what we do uh, for the matching is that we actually set these two scales equal. So we set mu equals m, because if we do that, then all of these logs cancel. And what that means physically is that we've performed this matching at a particular scale, at the heavy mass scale. We've said these amplitudes must be equal at this very high energy corresponding to uh, around the mass of this new particle. And so what the predictions that we're going to get for the matching are going to be uh, values of CS and CT at this particular mass scale, at this particular energy. So doing the final uh, cancellations and matching, we get that uh, our one loop matching result, it turns out that this CS actually doesn't get any corrections at, at one loop, so it stays to be lambda squared plus order alpha squared now because we know that order alpha is zero, and uh, CT gets a loop-induced contribution uh, proportional then also to, to this lambda squared. So there's no one loop correction to CS, and the leading contribution to CT arises at one loop. So we're now all champions of one-loop matching. Uh, it wasn't that bad, I think, although, of course, theories can become more complicated. This was a rather simple toy example. Um, and I should also mention that there are alternative methods that can be used to, to perform this uh, matching, even at one loop, such as these functional methods where you, uh, you, you define this effective action uh, and, and uh, perform the matching in that way. And this is a nice... Uh, uh, series of works on the universal one-loop effective action, which, uh, which can uh, uh, tell you how that works if you're interested. Okay, so I mentioned uh, running and mixing. Uh, so going back to the full EFT result, uh, we recall that, that there were some UV poles in there. And we said that we were going to use some appropriate subtraction scheme to renormalize them. Uh, so, indeed, you see that there are contributions both in CS and in the CT Lorentz structures at one loop, coming from corrections to a, to a process that involves only CS. And so, if you combine this with also the wave function normalization calculation that needs to be done to renormalize the full theory, uh, the EFT, uh, then you will get that some counter terms are required, which look something like this. So, you'll need one counter term for CS and one counter term for CT, as we mentioned. And this actually defines the so-called anomalous dimension matrix of this particular effective theory. So it's a matrix uh, with uh, some uh, loop factor in front uh, and some coefficients in here, where what we calculated here was these two entries over here. And it basically tells you how uh, these two uh, operators interact at one loop and evolve as a function of energy. So if we had done a bit more calculation, we would have then filled in these, these two uh, entries as well. And this uh, anomalous dimension matrix is therefore then uh, used to define the RG equations for the, for the different uh, Wilson coefficients. So you see that they, they, they basically depend on each other. The RG equation of one coefficient depends on both. And this is so-called operator mixing. And you can solve, uh, so this is explicitly the RG uh, equations, and so you can solve them to find the evolution of the different couplings. In particular, if you wanted to probe this theory at uh, an energy below M, then you would have to solve these equations and run the coefficients down to your experimental energy to get the correct prediction at that energy. So mini summary so far. Uh, EFTs approximate physical systems with scale separation uh, by only including relevant low energy degrees of freedom. They supplement this uh, low energy theory then with an operator expansion instead. 
Uh, I hope I convince you that this is order by order renormalizable uh, QFT, uh, and that there's a well-defined matching procedure to uh, predict these various Wilson coefficients. That is systematically improvable through higher order terms, either in the power counting or in the perturbative expansion. In particular, these higher dimensional operators tend to have power-like contributions to amplitudes as a function of external momenta, which basically means that you get cross-sections that grow with energy uh, below the new physics scale. And that's a nice feature that, that is very important to exploit when one is interested in studying, constraining, uh, uh, looking for EFT effects. So how might we do that? How might we search for new physics using EFTs? Well, let's stick to our toy model. So we have this heavy scalar phi, uh, and we want to find out if it's there or not. So we build some Psi-Psi collider and study Psi-Psi scattering. We measure a bunch of, of quantities, total cross-sections, differential cross-sections, in particular trying to go to the high energy region to exploit this energy growth of these operators. And then we use this data to constrain or measure the values of CS and CT, which corresponds to an indirect probe of the fundamental parameters of our theory uh, involving phi, so the coupling lambda and the mass scale m. So why is this useful if we already know the full theory? I could have just computed everything in, in the original theory in the first place and, and got the same or similar constraints on, on, on these two parameters. And in fact, I haven't reduced the number of parameters at all. Right? Two Wilson coefficients, two parameters. Um, why is this useful? Well, for one thing, we can now use the EFT to compute any observable we like in this theory. We never have to refer to, to the original parameters of the theory anymore. So that can be convenient if the theory is more complex than, than the EFT. In this case, it's a bit less obvious because the model is very simple. But in general, it's, it's most likely true. But of course, it's most useful if we don't actually know the full theory because the EFT is generic and model independent and applies to all heavy new physics above, uh, above the scale uh, of your experiment. So one thing you might do is, for example, get limits on these two parameters once and for all. Use the experiment, constrain CS and CT only. Don't worry about phi, don't worry about any theory. Uh, and then later on, at the interpretation stage of these constraints on the EFT coefficients, uh, use that to then indirectly constrain any kind of model that you like, as long as it fulfills the criteria of the EFT. So this is just a pictorial representation of what I just said. You know, you might have some model in mind. It's not too bad, usually, to make predictions to, to see what happens in your data. But, but, you know, there's actually many UV models. We don't really have a good indication of what's the right model, oftentimes. And so you start to get even more predictions, uh, and, and it starts to get a little bit cumbersome. And so what one does instead is take every model and just match it to an EFT, uh, and then we can make these predictions once and for all to the data. So the EFT kind of serves as an interface between the UV physics and the low energy phenomena. Indeed, it's the ultimate bottom-up theory for, for arbitrary heavy new physics as long as it actually reproduces your low energy theory in the IR. And this is, of course, very good, provided that it's actually used properly. I.e., there are a few rules that you need to obey when you, when you want to use EFT. Now, the golden rule, of course, is that your new physics scale is sufficiently higher than all other relevant mass scales in your, in your calculation. That's the basic thing. Otherwise, uh, your expansion just doesn't work. So this is related to the validity of the EFT. And then the second, slightly more subtle rule is that, that you're really only allowed to do global analyses, which also Fabio alluded to in his talk, uh, in the sense that you should really, from a bottom-up perspective, include all possible independent operators that are consistent with the assumptions, the symmetries of your low-energy theory. Because ultimately, you don't really know what, uh, what kind of operators your, new mo your model might actually generate. So how might we interpret this in a valid way? So we assume that we're doing a bottom-up analysis. We don't know what our model is anymore. Uh, and we try to constrain operators, therefore, without thinking about where they come from. So we have this two-dimensional parameter space, which looks like it has three parameters. But really, lambda is just a fictitious scale that we pulled out ourselves, right? 
uh, just to, to, to make see the couplings dimensionless. So it should never really be directly identified with the true mass scale of uni physics. It's related in some way, but it's not equal to it. Indeed, we can only measure this ratio, in fact, CS over lambda squared, not lambda, uh, and, and therefore what we use this value for and infer about the heavy mass scale m is really a matter of interpretation. And it depends on the specific predictions for your Wilson coefficient, which is another way of saying that it's model dependent. So what's really important is just make sure you don't probe an EFT at energies above the new, new, new physics mass scale that you're interpreting uh, uh, the, the results in. Because otherwise, this expansion will break down. All orders become equally important, uh, and which is kind of another way of saying that in your model, you would probably expect some resonant production of, a new, of this new state that, that you've integrated out, but then accidentally gone too far in your EFT to actually reach its mass threshold. So all of this to say that, that I'd like to emphasize that testing the validity criterion is really an a posteriori exercise. So it's something that you can only do after you get your constraints on the EFT. So suppose we do this thing about measuring psi psi production at our collider, uh, and, and we use, say, the invariant mass distribution of this system to get some limit on, on this coefficient CS. CS over lambda squared less than one TV inverse. Doesn't matter what the value is. We can plot that. As a, as a quadratic function in C as a function of lambda. This region is excluded. And then we want to say, okay, let's interpret this EFT result in our phi model, in our model of a heavy scalar with a Yukawa coupling to the fermions. This then allows us to infer constraints on this model by using the matching condition that we computed at tree level uh, relating these two quantities and it turns out this is basically a straight line in this, uh, in this parameter space. But there are a few conditions, further conditions on the validity. At some point, your value of lambda becomes unreasonable, right? If lambda is too large, i.e. reaches non-perturbative values, then your initial theory probably wasn't predictive for you to do the matching in the first place. So there's some upper bound on this new physics coupling for which you don't really trust the predictions of your full theory, non-perturbative. And the other condition is related to the exact uh, uh, setup of your particular uh, experimental uh, measurement. Because indeed we measure this stuff, or our data, at some energy, right, or some mass bin of, of an invariant mass distribution. And so our new physics scale We've got to make sure that that's sufficiently high, so beyond the experimental energy that we used to probe the EFT in order to, to retain this, this validity criterion of the EFT. Otherwise, we have this breakdown of, of the EFT expansion. So in this region, let's say M is sufficiently larger than E, and so we exclude interpreting this theory anywhere below. And so this is the kind of uh, picture that arises when you try and interpret uh, EFT measurements in, in a theory where actually this valid region of parameter space uh, is only known after you measure it. So, so basically you can, any, any range of values of lambda, lambda and m beyond this line are, are still okay. And anything before this is, is excluded in a valid way. But you don't know what this region is until you actually perform the measurement because you don't know how far along this line will be. And perhaps the worst case scenario would be if this line actually lies inside of the uh, other uh, exclusions from other theoretical considerations. That means that essentially your EFT measurement was unable to constrain this theory in a consistent way, this UV theory. So I think I emphasize that this is really a model dependent exercise. Although we say that EFTs are ultimately model independent, that's true, the description is model independent, but the interpretation itself is an intrinsically model dependent exercise. And it depends on your assumptions of, of what, the, what the values of the Cs are and what the value of the, the mass scale is. And there are things like, do you get tree level matching? Do you get only matching at one loop? Is your theory weakly coupled? Is your theory strongly coupled? 
all these things affect what the valid region is for your interpretation of your theory when it comes to the constraints of, of the EFT. So we've got about, what, five minutes or so, something like that? Five, ten? Okay, I'll try to get to the end of this lecture. I think it's possible. So uh, the other thing I mentioned, apart from the EFT validity, was this idea of global interpretations being important. So we must consider all possible operators of a given dimension. As I said, in general, we don't know which operators UV physics could generate. So we want to cover our bases. Also, as we saw, the RG evolution, in the end, mixes operators together anyway. So even if uh, you set something to zero, it's really only a scale, it's a scale dependent statement. It's only valid at one particular scale. And indeed, only symmetries can really protect you and forbid certain operators from, and protect them from, from uh, 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 radiative uh, induction. On the other side, ignoring operators can also sometimes lead to over-optimistic bounds on the practical side. Because indeed, operators might even cancel each other in their prediction for, for particular observables. So in our matching example, uh, we predicted opposite signs for these two Wilson coefficients. I'm not sure if that actually manifests itself in a cancellation or not, but it could, just in principle. So these one-at-a-time operator constraints that people show sometimes, they're instructive. They tell you about how much a given measurement is constraining a particular direction in the parameter space, but they're not robust. So they don't fairly uh, uh, constrain the real set of models that might actually uh, lie above the CFT. So robust statistical analysis will actually account for the simultaneous variation of all the relevant coefficients if you want to get a fair idea of what the allowed uh, volume in the parameter space is, you have to do this exercise. And this will, in, in the end, impact the confidence intervals that you derive on the individual coefficients. This uh, exercise is often called marginalization or profiling. This is a statistical technique, which is done uh, always in these global fits of EFT uh, uh, parameters. So all possible operators, you might say, well, actually, the space of operators at a given dimension is kind of infinite because there's, you, know, you can represent them in so many different ways. There are so many possibilities for the operators that you can write down at a given dimension. But thankfully, there are actually a lot of redundancies. And there are, at, at a given dimension, there's only a finite number of operators that are actually independent, i.e., they give independent contributions to on-shell S-matrix elements in your theory, in your EFT. And so, of course, operators, um, much like general Lagrangian terms, can be related by simple identities, things like integration by parts, uh, Fiat's identities in the Dirac or the gauge group algebras, uh, and also, uh, most importantly, probably field redefinitions and or equations of motion. So this equivalence theorem states that an S matrix is unchanged by field redefinitions, generic field redefinitions on the field of your theory. And this, in fact, can be used in the EFT picture to eliminate certain operators in favor of others in your basis. And indeed, this non-redundant set of operators is often referred to as a basis of operators. So just a quick example of how that comes about. Uh, a small change in a field, as you know, induces a variation of the action of your theory. When you learned about the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, you saw that, indeed, you, this thing pops out proportional to this uh, shift in the field delta. So if, in the case of an effective action, you wrote it as an expansion in this uh, uh, lambda parameter cutoff, where you have, say, just the first dimension six term here. Uh, and, and if you appropriately define this field redefinition as also a one over lambda squared effect, so a small effect, proportional to whatever, some function of, of phi, which all it has to do is preserve the symmetries of the theory. So it has to have the same quantum numbers as your original field. And you do this, sub this in, you find that what you get in here is indeed the same thing, the equation of motion, but only for the zeroth order theory, because everything else is higher order, right? And so you get the zeroth order EOM plus some dimension eight terms. And if you appropriately choose this coefficient a and this function f, you can actually use it to eliminate an operator that's inside already this, uh, this Lagrangian L1. 
So if some operator, say, is defined by some coefficient times this, this function that I chose carefully, and some other uh, uh, building block, which is contained in this zeroth order EOM, then I can tune this uh, A to be, say, minus C or something like that, CI, and then just change my Lagrangian to be L0 plus some new high, higher dimension in Lagrangian, L1 prime, which now contain, doesn't contain this original operator OI, and perhaps also generally will have some shifted values of the coefficients for, for this, uh, uh, the other operators in there. And so we know that from the equivalence theorem, this action has exactly the same matrix, uh, S matrix as the original one. And so we're free to do that. And we can use this to eliminate redundancies and show that there's a, a finite set of independent operators at any given dimension. So this is my last slide for this hour. Um, the roadmap for the bottom-up EFT, just to summarize a little bit. We started with our UV model, uh, and we performed some matching down to some EFT basis, where we, this, this matching was defined at the new physics scale. And then what you would do then is probably run this down using the RGEs to uh, some experimental energy that you were interested in probing the theory at. And then you want to then predict a whole bunch of observables. And we've spent much of this week learning about how we might go about doing that. So fine rules, MAGRA 5, Pythia, Delphys, if it's related to the LHC, of course. And then these observables, uh, or this set of data, can then be used and combined into a likelihood function, so-called, which is then used to infer constraints in a global fit on these parameters of your theory. And using that, you can finally infer some information back on your original UV model. So probably it's a good time to stop, no? Yeah. So, so next time I'll talk about the standard model as an EFT. Given an, uh, a complete theory, is there a prescription where you can exactly count the number of independent operators, the number of the set, uh, the basis set that you meant? So that's a good question. I think, firstly, as I said, given a particular mass dimension of operators uh, and a certain field content of your low energy theory, okay, for not the high energy theory, but the low energy theory, there is, there is a set way to... Um, identify the number of independent operators at a given dimension. Um, that's known. I'll, I'll cite a reference, actually, in the next lecture. Now, given a UV theory, however, which you would like to match down to that low-energy EFT, I don't know of any prescription to know how many such operators would be generated. So Fabio also mentioned this in his, in his lectures, where not only do you not know what operators your UV theory might generate, but you also don't know if it's going to generate the full set of available operators. So it might actually generate a subset because of some symmetry or, or other. And so this is something I think which can only be done by actually doing the matching uh, at the interpretation stage. Uh, and, and indeed, if it turns out that your theory is only able to generate a subset of your EFT, you also probably have to do a new fit because in your original fit you included everything and so you're kind of being a little bit too conservative when it comes to constraining this specific model. So uh, in the toy model, uh, for improved matching case, we got an eight-dimensional operator. So whether this eight-dimensional operator mix uh, via uh, renormalization group, whether uh, this mixes with eight-dimensional operators with different Lorentz st structures or with the dimension six operators. So dim eight definitely mixes with dim eight, uh, but I think that the renormalization group running is closed at different orders, as far as I understand. I know you can run into lower, I think you can run into lower dimensions, actually. That's right. So in general, what doesn't happen is that low dimensional operators mixing up into, into higher dimensional operators. So, so dimension six operator would never mix into dimension eight operator. But there are some cases for specific types of operators where 
higher dimensional operators can mix down into lower dimensional operators. So they can contribute to the running of lower dimensional parameters. So a good example of this is in this sound model EFT at dimension six, this actually can contribute to the running of the standard model couplings, which have come from dimension four, right? So you have a dimension six EFT, which is contributing to the running of the uh, standard model parameters, dimension four. So by specific means, um, uh, which type of operators? Um... Uh, the ones I know of are the ones which have, so you, you have to be able to start with the, something which has a Lorentz structure of, of, of high dimension, like say six or eight, and then usually after electroweak symmetry breaking, you end up with something lower. So I'll talk about that in the lectures to tomorrow, but normally it's things involving the Higgs field. Because the Higgs field takes a vacuum expectation value, uh, it, it kind of lowers the effective dimension of operators down to, to something like the standard model, the dimension four, in the case of dimension six. So, uh, so in the four Fermi theory, so you have taken the uh, the first order derivative. So I've taken what? Sorry. The second. Uh, first order. First term. order derivative yes, yes, of the yes. Fermi. So, I mean, why you are truncating and up to that first order derivative, you can take the second order derivative of the fermion and can have the matching. Yes, and yes, you could do that if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Fermi interaction is defined by this dimension six term. So when you match to the standard model, uh, you, you only need the first term. But if I wanted to get a better prediction in this Fermi theory for this muon decay, I could keep more terms and get dimension eight, 10, whatever. But I know the full theory anyway, it's the W, so I can just get the prediction. So there's no real, no real need for it, I think. Uh, so in slide number 28, you have uh, CS and CT. For yep. EFT, you got CT terms, but for full theory, there was no CT term. So um, how are you uh, going to take care about the CT term in the EFT? One second, let me uh, get the slide up. So you said slide what? 28. 28, okay. So you, could you go, go with the question again so while I'm doing this? Okay, uh, you are doing this uh, CS and CT. Yes. Huh. So uh, here, for the tree level uh, in the EFT, yes, here. for the second operator, you have yes. a CT term. But uh, for the fill theory, there was no uh, tree level term. Yes. Huh. So how are you going to take care about the tree level term in the full EFT? I'm not. So, let me summarize what I think you said. Um, so at leading order, tree level matching, I predict only a coefficient of CS proportional to lambda squared, CT zero. Okay, the, the theory doesn't predict this operator at tree level. And you're saying now at one loop, I've induced something which looks like CT. So what that's telling me is that my matching is telling me that if I do it, if I improve the precision of my matching uh, procedure, I find that actually my theory does generate this CT operator, which means I should have started with uh, a, a set of operators CS and CT. This is basically just telling me that. And indeed, if I had followed the rules in the first place and written all possible allowed operators, then I would have started with CS and CT anyway. So that's taken care of by adding all possible allowed independent uh, operators. So using a full basis at that given order, then you'll never, you'll never uh, miss something, if you like. What can happen is that if you integrate out a theory, you might generate an operator that's not in your basis. So it's, but it, you know that it's related to your operators of your basis by some kind of field definition or something. So what you would have to do then is eliminate that operator, bring it back into your basis, and then you would have the prediction for your EFT. And one more thing, uh, uh, when you are doing the global analysis, you are taking some operators, okay, but uh, inside that operators, you are uh, ignoring some of the operators because they are not contributing that much individually. So is that a good approximation? Uh, it can be, yeah. I mean, when you 
do the global fit, you can try and be clever a bit. Uh, of course, the most fair thing to do is switch everything on, but you might know that, say, this operator has a very, very suppressed contribution to one observable, then you could justify neglecting it in this predict prediction for this observable. Often, other things, something which happens is that even though some set of operators contributes to a measurement that you want to include in your fit, you actually know that, say, a subset of these are extremely constrained from other measurements. So a good example is, for example, LEP measurements constraining a subset of operators versus now LHC measurements that you would like to make on your, uh, on your new other operators which have not been constrained before. So then it can be a, a, an approximation that you can justify to, to set some of these things to zero, but uh, ultimately as the precision improves of everything, you, you would like to include as much as possible. But sometimes you're limited by practical things, so just too big parameter space or something, then you want to try and uh, yeah, reduce things a bit just to simplify. Thank you. I think Richard had a well, question. Well, the question say that you don't like, that you move forward. <laughs> <laughs> so let's thanks uh, Ken again.